My name is Naomi Stead and I am a professor and the head of the Department of Architecture at Monash University and this series, Light at the End of a Tunnel, Light at the End of the Tunnel, is a collaboration between Monash Architecture and Parla. As always, we begin by acknowledging, uh, on, behalf of, on behalf of Parla, acknowledge the traditional custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to the Indigenous Australians who are part of our community. This series, um, if this is in fact the 22nd in this series, Light at the End of the Tunnel, which looks into architecture as a profession, a discipline and a practice and how it will be affected, is being affected by the pandemic. This week, I'm very pleased to say our guests are Shelley Duffy and Tihua Gill, speaking on the subject of migra migration. Um, Justine will introduce Tihua and Shelley in a moment, but first some protocols for the session. As always, please make sure your microphone is on mute unless you're actually speaking. Um, we do ask you if you're able and if your internet allows to keep your camera on so we can see your faces and have a sense of community. The format is Q&A. It's meant to be informal but informative. Um, Justine and I will ask questions and keep things flowing, but we will also take questions from the floor throughout. So please, if you have questions, put them into the chat uh, and then Justine and I will pick out questions and ask whoever wrote it to um, say the question in person. Um, if you can't, for whatever reason, just note that in the chat and we'll, we'll put it for you. Uh, please also feel free to add your own observations and experiences into the chat. Um, we're really very happy for you to reflect or um, tell stories or make a kind of parallel narrative uh, happening alongside. It doesn't have to be just questions. And while we won't get to all of the questions, we usually don't, um, the things that you ask will help to inform the topics of subsequent sessions. And as always, we thank those who ask excellent questions that we simply don't have a chance to get to. Um, now I'm going to throw to Justine to introduce Shelley and Tihua. Thanks, Naomi, um, and it's very nice to have you back. We've had some lovely co-hosts in recent weeks, but it's very good to have you back here as my um, colleague. So, um, as Naomi said, this session looks at some of the challenges facing our international colleagues in Australia um, during the pandemic and as the result of feedback that we've had through our Midday Monday sessions. Uh, we're really pleased to have Shelley and Tiwa here to talk through the issues with us. Um, um, it's a topic that Naomi and I are not that familiar with, so we're very reliant on having their expertise. So Shelley is a registered migration agent and she's the owner of Simply Visas. She has extensive experience of working with the built environment practitioners and comes very, very highly recommended. When, um, when the invitation went out to the session, I got a lot of feedback about how wonderful Shelley is from people who've worked with her. So um, always nice to get that. Um, Tiwa is a studio manager of Grimshaw Architects, um, in which capacity she has uh, dealt with the employment of people from all over the world. Uh, Tiwa's a great friend to Paula. Um, she's the person who recommended Shelley to us. And of course, many of you will remember the wonderful se um, session uh, that she did around uh, cultural diversity. So welcome back, Tiwa. Uh, just one thing to note uh, is that Shelley can't provide advice on specific cases in this forum. She can talk about general approaches to ensuring that the processes are as accessible and supportive as possible, um, but can't provide sort of formal advice on individual cases at this stage. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. Nice to see you all there. Look at those lovely, <laughs> lovely faces. Okay, so let's get started. And we thought Shelley would ask, um, asking what you do because we're, this is a new field for us. So what does being a migration agent involve? So basically um, I assist individuals uh, and companies with their visa, with the visa application process. So uh, we assist with a broad range of visa types um, from temporary visas, um, permanent residency, partner visas, parent visas, um, a broad range. Um, so from the uh, company side, basically guiding them through the requirements for, um, you know, meeting their criteria, meeting criteria as a business sponsor um, for temporary and permanent visas. And then from the individual side, assisting them from the 
um, beginning of the process until their visa has been approved uh, to gather all the required documents and then make sure that they have a good knowledge of the conditions associated with their visa once it's been approved. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what, what we do, uh, what I do as an agent um, and at Simply Visas it's myself and I have um, a colleague, um, her name's Sarah as well. So it's just the two of us in Simply Visas at the moment. And Shelley, is it, do you always only ever do incoming visas or do you ever do outgoing visas as well? Uh, only coming into Australia. So we specialise in Australian immigration law, so only coming in. So what would a kind of traditional uh, conventional day, like a classic standard day be for you? You know, how many people would you be working with? And uh, so we would probably have about, I would say, um, 20 cases or so on the go at once, um, a variety of different visa types. Um, a general day would probably be um, fielding inquiries, um, you know, new inquiries coming in, as well as assisting um, people who have got their applications on the go and then also lodging applications to the department as well. So um, yeah, that would kind of be a typical day just um, going through those processes. And so let's sort of go to the challenges that people are facing at the moment. What are the, um, what are the kind of key um, challenges or uh, issues that people are facing in this kind of pandemic context at the moment? Uh, so for people on working visas, I guess the main um, the main challenge would be work um, slowing down um, and hours being reduced, uh, people being made redundant. So if you're on a temporary working visa, you do have um, pretty strict conditions that need to be met. Um, and you also have to ensure that you're earning a, um, a, a set salary um, to meet the conditions of your visa. So um, that is a pretty big challenge for people um, having their, their work slow down um, and navigating that. Um, and also I think as well, probably um, another thing which it would be across the board, not just for visa holders is maybe the style of working um, changing um, and not really you know, being part of the, the day-to-day -day conversations and interactions that you may um, normally in an office environment. Hmm. Yes, we've heard that a lot, um, a lot through this series. And I can imagine for those who are new to Australia, that may present an even, even more of a challenge, that kind of sense of disconnection. Um, I get, Tewa, what about your, from your perspective, what, what are the challenges that you've that you're seeing at the moment? I mean, it's interesting. Thanks, Justine. Um, and if I could just say, Shelley's fantastic, everyone. So please reach out to her. But I guess we, I mean, we're all aware it's, you know, we're in tricky and unpredictable times and, you know, international students and local and architects. I mean, I think we're all feeling a little bit daunted at the moment, you know, in terms of those trying to find work in this current climate, but also those who are currently working in practice and to Shelley's point, just trying to understand and navigate the, you know, the adjustments that their practice may be experiencing now, um, especially if you're based in Melbourne, um, you know, there's an extra sort of added layer of complexity uh, with the current stage four restrictions in place and, you know, which is limiting contact to mostly the virtual environment. And I think, you know, I've been speaking with people and I think some people on this call actually, we've been corresponding. Um, I can see some f familiar names and just definitely being involved in sort of some other job forums. Uh, a lot of people sort of feel, feeling like they're falling sort of between the cracks in some way, because we are, you know, managing things through this virtual environment. But I also want to say there are some really positive stories coming out of the current climate where there's sort of, you know, increased opportunities for mentoring and advocacy and actually, you know, taking the time to spend with people, and especially those that are not so familiar with, I guess, the broader architectural kind of practice um, who are um, part of the local community, you know, um, in particular international students. Um, but I think, you know, the core challenges as, you know, to Shelley's raise is if you try to come into the country, just simply the kind of border restrictions at the moment and also for practices, understanding sort of the costs involved in hiring people versus someone that's already here. I mean, I think those challenges always exist, although from a global perspective, we certainly have a lot of international people working for us um, and often that's sort of project specific related at the moment. Um, I, but I think that, you know, those that, you know, come from other countries, you know, other challenges are also, you know, they're magnified because I think 
building networks is probably, you know, as we know, one of the most important things um, when you're practicing or in any industry really. And then I think, you know, those impromptu kind of conversations that you have to get to know somebody or even people looking for work, you know, dropping a CV off to a practice and, you know, having a conversation with someone that you may not have met and that would lead to a new connection. So everything's just a little bit more, you know, layered, I think. Um, I also think though within practice too, when we're in this virtual environment, you know, there are people that are more confident to approach other people, um, to ask for help or to understand what's going on. And I think that sort of, you know, the forming of relationships is just, again, further complicated. And that's just, that's with local people as well. But I think for, in particular, and, you know, through my experience, we've got a couple of international graduates actually, and, um, you know, just to make them feel extra connected and, and understand when we give the studio updates, you know, we kind of, there's an assumption that we all know what's going on. We know the kind of the local, you know, the nuances that are happening and to just make sure you have that extra connection with people and to go out of your way and to almost sort of form a buddy system in some sense. And I know people on this call um, are sort of aware of, and they're also in their own practice doing all the group mentoring as well. That's keeping people connected and that sort of cross studio communication. Um, and I'm, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it is really about connections and definitely through my current experience of, of people that aren't from here is about building community. And I think that that is taking extra effort um, and it's having an impact on, you know, mental health and wellbeing in practices. And I know in the forum yesterday, I think a lot of people on this call actually joined as well was understanding that space around about about their own practice, but also about people that aren't from, you know, Melbourne or Sydney or, or have gone to the universities or through all their life, but even maybe done their masters somewhere and just building that community back at the university and within practice as well. So I think I really go back to that sense of place, sense of connection. Um, and I could talk about sort of, you know, the employees, the employer side of how to kind of navigate the kind of downturning work and how to respond generally and how that would probably could impact um, you know those that are on you know that those aren't, don't have the same rights or, or eligibility for, for support um, I can talk more around about that as we well. We can talk more about that in the next bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's fabulous too I thank you. So, so Shelley for people whose working conditions have changed and that they and they can't meet their visa conditions, what's the situation? Because I presume they also can't go home. Yeah, so the the department is applying some flexibility around the conditions at the moment, which is good. Um, and I think the latest update from the department was around the 9th or 10th of October, um, just stay, stating that if you had been um, if you had been stood down rather than, you know, let go completely or your hours were, re were reduced, that the department would take that into consideration and you wouldn't be in breach of your visa conditions. So I think from a company's perspective, it's really important to ensure that you're keeping, um, keeping your obligation, making sure you're meeting your obligations in terms of keeping the department informed if you are changed, if there are any changing circumstances with your overseas workers. And then I think um, from the visa holder side uh, to, you know, I guess um, see, which I think kind of will lead into the next question as well a little bit, but um, asking for that flexibility to, um, to, to give you um, a little bit more um, leeway in terms of your meeting your visa conditions because as I say the department is applying some flexibility at this time because of the pandemic so um, just making sure that you you as a visa holder are aware of that and that your employer is aware of it as well. Yeah. Naomi do you want to well, yes, I'm just looking um, in the chat here. They're not exactly questions, more comments, but good comments. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce uh, G-I-O-I-A. Is it Gia? Yeah, it's Gia. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I mean, yours isn't exactly, is it kind of observation more than a question, but do you want to elaborate on that at all? Uh, yeah, it's not my case, fortunately, but it's a colleague of mine or ex-colleague that unfortunately I've been let go and she was a sponsor's uh, kind of visa so it's very hard and as someone else already pointed out it's virtually impossible to find another 
sponsor visa and because I think you have about 60 days to find another visa. So, and uh, your challenge is what you're going to do now. You have to leave the country basically and all your relationship that you have built so far. And it, it is very hard. That is, of course, the worst case scenario um, of the challenges that someone has faced. Mm. Mm. So Shelley, do you, um, what, I mean, what would you advise a person to do if they found themselves in such a circumstance? Yeah, so um, when you do, on a, on a temporary working visa, a 457 or a 482, if you do um, lose your job, if either party terminates, um, you basically have 60 days in order to find another role and transfer your visa across to the new organisation, apply for another visa type or depart Australia. So yes, it is a relatively short time frame. So particularly at the moment, what I'm advising clients and, um, you know, from individuals and companies is first of all, to ask um, if leave without pay is an option um, because with, uh, with a TSS visa, you can, um, avail of leave without pay. So you basically could ask the company on a 482 for up to three months of leave without pay. And if they're willing to accommodate that for you, then that's going to buy you just a little bit extra time to, you know, sort yourself out and find another role. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's one thing I have been advising a lot of clients of is um, to see if you can, um, have a conversation with your employer, see if they're, if they're willing to put you on leave without pay for a period of time. And then obviously after that leave without pay ends, that's when your 60 days would kick in. So essentially if you got the three months and then the 60 days, you're giving yourself a five month window to, to find another role or, you know, potentially apply for another visa type or um, worst case scenario depart. But um yeah, that's basically um, the advice that I have been given at the moment, as well as to, you know, see if reducing hours or being stood down is an option as opposed to being let go, uh, being made redundant. So really just um, keeping dialogue open and seeing if, um, if there is any flexibility. So, Maka, you've made the point in the, in the comment here that... Um, the difficulties of if you if on a, being on a temporary visa, if you leave, you can't come back. Do you want to explain that a little bit more from your perspective? Um, thanks, thanks, Justine, and nice to see you, Naomi. Um, I mean, it is it is tough um, because it's not that anybody is traveling these days, and it's not that traveling is really an option. Uh, but that feeling of actually really not being able to do it because once you leave, you can't come back. Um, I don't know for other people, but that has really made a difference for me this year. Um, but on a positive note, since we're talking about, you know, migration and architecture, I'd like to say that um, architecture is one of the professions that actually allows you to work um, regardless of the visa that you're in, like, um, or, or, or at least that's the experience that I know of other uh, Spanish architects. It may differ uh, from other people's experiences, but um, offices are happy to take you um, with the restrictions that your visa has, whereas other people find it a lot harder uh, to find employers um, with a work and holiday visa or with a student visa. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that would be my contribution. Thanks, Becca. So, so Shelley, is that your experience that architects tend, architecture as a sort of industry is, is relatively open to international workers? I think so, yeah, that has been my experience. I think um, definitely the, I, I, I work with a number of architecture firms um, across Australia and yes, for the right talent, I think that definitely they're open to um, taking people on on the sponsored visa and then also um, uh, taking them through to their permanent residency as well, um, you know, as as they progress. Um, so yeah, I think most definitely I'd agree with that. And Tewa, do you want to chime in with um, some of your experience from from that employer perspective? Yeah, no, it's really interesting, and I, I think most recently. Um, probably in the last year, a lot of our kind of um, overseas employment has actually been to our New Zealand project office. So New Zealand immigration, I've been dealing with those agencies is slightly different to Australia. It's, it's less mired in bureaucratic red tape, I'd have to say. They're much more flexible. Um, 
I, I think in terms of in, in terms of I guess searching for talent from overseas, I, I Grimshaw is global, so we receive an we receive an overwhelming amount of applications. Um, and I think, you know, sorting through all that, but it's very open. And I have worked in practices that just don't want to recruit from overseas at all. So it's actually really refreshing um, to see a practice that just is very open and diverse and, and welcomes people from all over the world. Um, I think in terms of, um, Probably the challenges right now, obviously, is, as we all know, is about the downturning work. But in terms of, I guess, navigating our own practices, and I obviously have to be sort of careful how I speak about it, but I, I know that, and to Shelley's point, you know, asking for leave without pay and, and looking at different ways of, of ensuring that your, you know, that ending employment doesn't trigger any sort of extreme um, case where you need to leave the country in 60 days. So. I mean, you'll have to do your own sort of research on JobKeeper, but that JobKeeper does go to the company. It doesn't go to individuals and the company can then use it as their discretion of how, obviously they have to meet their mere requirements of how they use that JobKeeper. But I'm hoping that all practices and all leadership groups really have a good think about um, if when there's a downturn, if they have to make certain adjustments to responding to project work or stoppage of work, that they really consider all the options to ensure that people aren't left by themselves. Um, and I can't speak for practices, but I'm really hoping that they do the best they can to work out how they can, as I said, repeating this, how they can support their team members. And the Australian JobKeeper scheme is there for keeping Australian permanent residents, and these, you know, residents on the books. And I'm hoping some of that discretionary job keeper can be used to funneling in other ways of keeping other people, um, you know, having some sort of income stream. And, you know, I know that leave without pay, you know, when you're on a visa and it, it allows you to stay in the country and so forth, but I'm hoping that practices will go that extra mile and to ensure there's other support. So I guess that's from the kind of looking at the kind of job keeper and the equivalent of job keeper of what can happen. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's the main point I want to make, Justine. I really hope that practices do interrogate that in more detail. Um, and I'm happy to speak to individuals about how they can ask those questions around that. Um, but I just, yeah. No, I think, Tewa, I think that's a really important point. I think as, you know, people are making these Adjustments to staffing, um, which are sometimes very necessary and, you know, and from a practice perspective, but can have all kinds of ramifications for different, different groups. So I think it's really important to have that front of mind. Okay, Naomi, do you have any? Or do we um, have? I was actually just, I just wondered if we could return to Shelley's point earlier about um, the leave without pay option, which seems like a, you know, excellent example of buying time. But it, let's say I was an employer and I was rather ignorant of um, migration law. I might be worried about doing that because if I was intending to still make that person redundant at the end of three months, I might be worried that I was seen to uh, be engaging in some kind of not fraudulent, that's too strong, but rule breaking behavior. So um, how do you think, um, I mean, obviously people shouldn't think that because you're telling us that that's okay <laughs> but I suppose it's really a question about um, whether companies are overly cautious when it comes to these kinds of questions. Yeah definitely I mean um, of course I think it's really good for companies to um, be aware of their obligations as a sponsor and ensure that they're meeting all the conditions because it, it can have um, you know a detrimental effect on the business they can be sanctioned and you know barred from sponsoring future workers so it's super good to be cautious um, and I can uh, I would refer companies to the legislation um, and you know it, it is legislated that you can take um, periods of unpaid leave without it affecting your um, visa conditions. So I guess it, um, so long as there is a formal um, leave application um, process so that they've filled out, you know, a, a, a formal leave form and it's signed by both parties and then the, you know, the dates are stipulated that it's for that period of time, um, then that would be totally, you know, within the, the legislation to to put that the employee, even if it was just a matter of, um, you know, reassessing 
halfway through and seeing how things were tracking from the business perspective. I guess it's just a way of, um, you know, giving the, giving that little bit of extra flexibility um, and the opportunity for the overseas worker to, um, I guess, get all their, their ducks in a row. Yeah. So it sounds like it's like possibly a little bit of a loophole, but a perfectly legal one. Um, I wonder if we might go to Charlotte's question. Charlotte, would you like to put your question in person? Charlotte Jones, are you there? Hi, sorry, I'm just turning my camera and everything on. <clears throat> okay, so um, hi, Shelley and everyone. Um, so I've just been recently made redundant um, from a six year uh, employment with the same employer. Uh, in the meantime, I've also gone through my citizenship um, process. So I applied about 18 months ago. Um, it got put on hold. It was a tricky process. I finally got to sit the interview and uh, test in September and I've got the letter saying that I'm approved, which is great. However, there's this um, interesting time frame now that I still have to wait to be sworn in, which is a process that can take between six and 12 months. Yep. So I'm sort of sitting in this position going, oh, okay, well, I'm, a I'm on a current resident return visa and a permanent resident of the country is such as far as I understand. Um, but if, if I'm not sort of currently employed, is that a breaching my current um, visa? So what, um, so you're on a resident return visa at the moment? Yes. So a resident return visa isn't tied to a particular um, organization. No, um, you no, no, there's no link to my employer as yeah. such. It's more just a, a general visa conditions that I haven't even considered until I signed in today. Yeah, so you, um, as I say, you're not tied to any particular employer. You don't have any set restrictions in terms of working in a certain occupation or working mm. for a um, set employer or working set hours. So yeah. you're basically free um, to do as you wish as a permanent resident. Um, so you're okay. not um, in breach of any conditions or anything like that. Okay, good, good. Because there, there's all these little, um, you know, in-between times when you have an application in process and things that makes, yeah. It gets tricky. Thank yeah, you. No, that's okay. Um, I wonder if we might go straight to Samira's question. Samira, would you like to put one? Hello. Hi, Shadi. Uh, I have a question about other kinds of visas. Um, I mean, the regional ones. We have five years of visa, and, and during these five years, we should work for three years permanently uh, in a company and while we are not allowed to enter to be us to Australia I wonder uh, how we can then uh, cover these obligations so at the moment are you offshore um, holding yeah. the regional visa yeah. And, and you have five years um, from the date of entry uh, sorry five years from the date of um, approval to enter yeah yes and, and we are not uh, allowed to enter, you know? These days are passing one after another and we're not able to enter. Yeah, we I would say, uh, which, uh, I, I think it would be a matter of um, checking what the restrictions are for which regional area you're, um, you've been designated to work in and um, seeing if they are applying any flexibility because I'm sure that there would be, you know, other people in the same scenario as yourself. Um, so it would be checking with the state or territory um, for your particular regional area and see what um, what flexibility they're applying at this point in time. Uh -huh. So uh, we should um, email to what, re what which people to where? So um, which state or territory, whichever state or territory? South um, Australia. South Australia. South yeah. Yep. So you'd need to uh, follow up with the um, the authority in South Australia who nominated you for the visa, and um, find out what what the situation is there, and see if they are applying any flexibility. Thank you. Thank no you worries. Very much. Okay, we've got floods um, of questions coming through now. <laughs> but where do you want to go next, Naomi? 
Jessica, do you want to make your observation? Hello, how are you going? Hi, Shelley. Hi, Jess, how are you going? <laughs> um, I, I work with Shelley quite closely um, um, over the years, just um, on visa applications and sponsorship in our office. And, you know, I think what we've been caught out right lately, I think it's, it's more that in this current climate, we're not really advertising any positions, you know, we, there's all this, you know, it's, 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 it's um, and you might, and it's probably the same for a lot of practices out there. And so when we have, um, what we have seen is if you need to, um, if you, you've got a potential candidate who's on a sponsored visa, it's very difficult for us to hire them because there's a 28 days waiting period. And even if we want to take, um, say, we might not have that advertising up for, if we've only just put the advertising up and we have to wait for 28 days. And so we're very, we're very limited in time. And so, it's sort of like, I think as an employer and an employee, potential employee, you kind of just need to know that, okay, it's like, how do we know? Like, it's really hard for us to, to establish, um, a, a, you know, a, a time frame, I guess, and putting a timeline to it because usually we end up having to wait and the potential candidate can't wait or they're looking for a place, right, you know, some, a, a position right away. And it's, it's been quite a challenge even for us, you know, um, trying to hire and or trying to, um, you know, um, find and secure somebody in this instance. Jessica, are you talking about the labour market testing? Yes, 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 yes. That one, Tila, yeah. Because that's been, I think that's the one that we always, I, I, I think everyone that I've been speaking with, it's always like, oh, no, no, we can't you know, we can't do anything in this 28 days. Like, I've, I mean, Shelley, yes, I ask you this a few times. <laughs> so, um, yeah. what uh, Jess is referring to is uh, with the um, 482, the TSS working visa, as an employer, you have to prove that you've tested the market in order to find an Australian worker before you go ahead and nominate an overseas worker. So as part of that process, you have to um, provide to the department evidence that you have advertised um, in th across three different mediums now. Um, so the job search website, along with two other, um, say, for example, LinkedIn or Seek, those job ads have to run for at least four weeks before you can make the official offer to the overseas candidate. So um, practices really need to be aware of that, that they need to um, be constantly advertising um, if, I guess, if there is the possibility that they're go going to be hiring overseas workers or if they come across an overseas worker and they are looking like they want to hire, then they need to set the expectation um, that they have to test the market first and that they can't officially offer them until that four-week period has passed. Okay. Mm. Has that been your, have you had experience with that TYR as well, that situation? Yeah, uh, absolutely. But I, I think, in, you know, and it just go, goes to show the level of investment from the employees in that sense, because when we're employed from overseas, you do go through kind of, there's a, there's a visa costs, there's a labour market testing, there's salaries below a certain level. Mm. Um, there's also um, a SAF levy, maybe Shelley can talk more about the SAF levy. So, you know, a visa can cost up to Fourteen thousand, fifteen thousand dollars, depending on, on, on you know the length of the visa you're looking for, um, especially in this situation. In currently, that your TSS visa and the board, the travel exemption visa are two different things, and that can create a level of complexity. But I think when we're talking to overseas candidates at the moment, right now I'm dealing with an overseas candidate um, that we're just saying your TSS visa is going to take longer to process not mm. just because of the labour market testing, but simply because of the COVID and the new, mm. the rules um, the, from the Department of Home and Affairs about travel exemption visas. So one person I've been to, I think could almost be up to, and sorry, Shelley, this is through some lawyers that we're dealing with with other levels of complexity, um, but this you know, could take up to eight to nine months before you can actually get into the country. So I think there is, you kind of have that conversation up front, the, the, you know, and I think some people are probably not aware of how tough Australian migration is, to be to be honest, and that's no one's fault. I mean, you know, we don't know about every other country's laws, um, but I think, especially for our, our British contingent, it is often a surprise around about what they have to do to be able to come here. Um, but certainly, yeah, as to Jessica's, Jessica's point, it can be frustrating when you know how you have to fill positions, but 
I guess if you are looking from over, for overseas candidates, the, you do already know there's a long process. And if that process is communicated at the very beginning, then hopefully that can be, you, you don't have any, any influence over it, unfortunately, but you know that that's the expectation around employing someone from overseas. Right. Um, I wonder if we might go to um, Arnab, who has a question about uh, graduate visas, which is related to his circumstance, but I think, you know, again, raises a kind of broad issue that others might be facing too. Are you there, Arnab? Yes, I'm there. Hi. Hi. Uh, sorry, I just missed the question. I had a delivery person waiting for me. Oh, okay. Kathy, well, would you like to just put, you've got your question here about your graduate visa. Would you like to put that question to Shelley? Yep. So, uh, you know, uh, I graduated uh, end of last year and I applied for my graduate visa. And now it's been almost October. So I got my visa on uh, April this year. And I was hoping that uh, if I get an employment uh, by that time and I can get that five extra point for having one year of experience locally yeah I can then be eligible for the permanent residency so right now i have 85 points so i've cleared all my english test and the, um, you know the community language test so how does that uh, like reflect on my part like moving forward you know uh, i have less than two years of uh, eligibility to work in australia now um, so that's basically my question so it's as you say um ultimately um going to have an effect on your overall point score uh, essentially and uh, your ability to so i think at, so you said you're at 85 points at the moment it's around 90 for general skilled migration um, that you need to be aiming for so um, i guess if you're unable to meet that one year of australian work experience to get you that extra five points you may need to be looking into other areas in order to obtain that extra five points that you need I don't know what your score was in English, um, but maybe that's another avenue to, to boost your points. But unfortunately, um, yeah, that's what you, I mean, you could put in your EOI at any time um, so that you're, you're in the pool, I guess, and yeah. you, you'd remain in that pool for two years. Yeah. And um, then once you do hit the 90, you can update your expression of interest um, at that point. But uh, yeah, you may have to look at other avenues to, to get you that five points that you need. So there's not any sort of flexibility being offered around that time frame due to COVID at the moment? Not for general skilled migration that I'm aware of. They, have, they haven't mentioned any concessions in that regard. Right, thank you. Uh, Badger has given us a, a very large amount of fabulous and quite specific advice, but I think maybe... Um, uh, it's very helpful. Thank you. Maybe we can call from the chat and take that advice and we might proceed to Christina's question. Christina, do you want to put your question? You're on mute. <laughs> Christina, you need to unmute. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I um, forgot the key point. Uh, so, I'm Christina. Hi, everybody. One of my friends applied for a distinguished talent visa and he got it, but he is awesome. So, no wonder he did that. I was wondering if it's a path for PhDs at all and when is the right time to apply because I heard different suggestions from different people and not all of them have been there. So, Question to Shelley, I guess. So with the um, Distinguished Talent Visa, one thing that did come out of the federal budget, uh, which was announced recently, was that that particular visa was going to take um, pre uh, prior be given priority over um, a lot of other visa types. So that, along with the business investment um, visa, is going to be given priority processing, which is really good news. Um, in terms of when to apply for it, it depends because um, you have to it's very specific you have to be working or you have to show that you have talent in a specific area um, and you have to show that you are you know well recognized in that area so it depends at what point you meet criteria in terms of when you would go on to make that application but what I can tell you is that when you do make it it will be um, given priority that particular application type 
So, so what does a distinguished talent visa involve? How, how distinguished do you have to be? <laughs> yeah, so you have to have a pretty, um, pretty impressive background uh, to, to apply for the distinguished talent visa. It's something that I'm going to be looking into in a lot more detail now that um, since the budget's been released, now that I know that it is going to be given priority over a lot of other visa types. Um, but yeah, you have to um, be in, I think it's one of five different industries, ag tech, um, IT, there's a few others I'm, I'm not going to quote, off, I don't know off the top of my head all five, um, but you have to have a pretty um, yeah, impressive um, background in one of those and be internationally recognised in one of those areas in order to apply. The good thing with that particular visa is with um, for example, general skilled migration, it's, it's points tested. You have to have a skills assessment done. And um, with the distinguished talent visa, that doesn't apply. So you don't have to have a skills assessment. There's no points threshold. So it's, a, I guess, a bit of a lower threshold than your point, uh, general skilled migration points tested visa. Um, but yeah, it, it's, um, you do have to have a, a very, um, I guess, impressive background in one of those fields. Um, I'm happy to provide some more detail on that directly to you, Christina. If you want to drop me an email, um, I can definitely get back to you with some more specifics on that. I wondered if I might ask you both a question actually about, um, which is less about the kind of technicalities or practicalities of negotiating visa systems and more about people who suddenly find themselves in a position where they're quite stressed and quite distressed because Perhaps their plans have been thrown into disarray. And I'm sure, Shelley, you must have people coming to you in quite a panic. Um, what kind of advice, I mean, can you give any advice, either of you, to a person who finds themselves in such a position? I guess, you know, I, Naomi, I think, you know, we've certainly had some situations that, you know, through my experience that have caused enormous anxiety and, and distress and, Two of those have been related to visas and they were actually leaving before sort of the COVID space, kind of, you know, the COVID, the real COVID sort of started to hit, um, but they were actually unable to get back home to their countries. Um, and there was a real panic because um, they, you know, the Department of Home Affairs are very hard to get on to, even though, you know, we, we do support them, but just that human interaction, wanting to know what their options were, you know, would they be deemed illegal if they couldn't get on their flight and so forth, because their visas were just running out, they were here for a fixed term. Um, and we did everything as a company to try and support them. So what we did is we, we used, we actually got them onto our lawyers to try and support them. Um, I actually walked one of them down to the Department of Home Affairs so I could help ask questions. Um, I think in, in, in that sense, it's just to make sure they have someone to talk to. Um, also, I think, I don't know if, you know, most practices have EAPs, Employment Assistance Programs, so people can reach out to those as well, and they do offer kind of free counselling advice. I mean, the two that had to leave because of their fixed term and their visas ending, we said, we'd love you to stay with us, like, let, let's see what we can do. but. We couldn't because of their visa conditions and they wanted to go back home. So it was their choice they actually wanted to leave. So I guess from the employer's perspective, we said we are here for you. You can have you keep having access to our email, whatever you need, keep joining all our practice things. Um, we will connect you with um, I think one of them was with Shelley at one point to see, you know, what other advice she could offer. Um, we try to get them direct connections to the Department of Home Affairs. So we really did everything we could in that space. I mean, I think in, in general terms around people going through certain situations, again, I mean, it's just trying to kind of advocate for advocate for them and, and be there. And, um, you know, I know they're very general terms and we all talk about them, but I can't stress the importance of actually making the time to try and help somebody um, during this really, 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 and I'm going to swear shitstorm situation we're in at the moment. Um, I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but I think in terms of um, understanding that, you know, you know, I'm lucky. I'm sitting in my house. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I've grown up here in that sense. I've got a good network. I can reach out to Parla. I can reach out to Justine. I can reach out to Shelley. You know, my parents are down the road. You know, I'm in a completely different situation to a lot of other people. So I think it's that putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Mm. I think that's really important. 
Yeah, well, exactly. Because I can just imagine that a person who, through no fault of their own, found themselves on the wrong side of the um, visa system, it could be a very, very isolated and extremely stressful situation. So, Shelley, that must be something you encounter quite frequently. It must be quite challenging for, in your job, I'm guessing. Yeah, it is a, definitely a um, challenging part of, of this role is when of when people are being let go in um, the best way to advise them when they do have such a short time frame. Um, from a visa perspective, if um, their visa is coming to an expiry, um, the department has provided a solution for those individuals whose visa is expiring within 28 days or has expired in the last 28 days. They have opened up a, um, a temporary subclass 408 visa, which basically um, you can put forward if you're working in a critical area or if you're um, just simply unable to depart. And they have put that um, application in place, that visa in place for those individuals to apply and give them the time, extra time that they need to, you know, um, to make arrangements to depart because some people just simply can't get flights out. Um, so that visa is in place, which is good. Um, but those who... Um, whose visas aren't coming to an expiry, it is, it is very difficult because they have that, um, if they're on a working visa, they have that strict 60 days um, to, to find a new position or p potentially lodge another visa type. So I guess it's a matter of um, assessing their individual needs and options to see what options they have, um, if any. And um, yeah, and with, as to Tiwa's point, um, I guess the, importance of their connections is um, it comes to fore there in terms of their network and reaching out and, you know, seeing if there's any other job opportunities for them. Mm. Mm. Naomi, I wonder if we might um, go to Badru, uh, go to Badru, who's, as you say, written an extraordinary amount of detail here, which I don't want you to repeat, Badru, but people can copy and paste that out of the chat if they'd like to. But I just um, think your bottom line about starting early, I just wonder if you might, off, I, from the perspective of someone who's gone through this, I presume, reading your comment, if you might just offer us some sort of overall, um, you know, comment and advice that, that's based in that, in that enormous amount of detail you've given us about um, starting early particularly. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Justine. Oh, hi, Naomi. Nice to see you back. Um, so, uh, as uh, I'm not going to repeat all that information, but I'm sure there's a lot of international students here in the chat today and not just people looking for sponsorship. And I'm aware that when I'd applied for it, it was a lot, e a little bit easier than it is now, but it wasn't entirely easy. And the truth is one thing I can advise is take all the tests while you are at uni. Some of these tests take months to get a date. And I started my process at the end of my first year. And that's an advice I got from a friend of mine who did it the same way. So I'm glad I took his advice. So this is the same advice that I'll give you. Uh, the other thing that I would say is do not listen to anecdotal you know, stories. All that information is there online. Cross-check, 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 cross-check three times if you have to. Even like, uh, well, Shelly, no disrespect there, but even if my agent was telling me something, I would ask him, can you please provide me the link where that information is? Uh, and that's just me doing my homework. It's not mistrusting the person I was with, but just like me knowing that information correctly as well. So I think the bottom line that I can tell anyone is do your homework. Nothing is easy. And working hard for those few months will give you a big benefit later on. And um, just so that I can share a bit more is I never had to go to my graduate visa because I applied for my PR eight days after I graduated. I emailed my uni ahead. I got everything ready. I was literally standing with the documents. If there was a physical door, I would be outside. But, you know, there was just an email. So um, that's one thing. So because I did it so quickly, I had an invite in 12 days. Uh, that's also because I had five points more than what was standard at that time. Everyone told me, you have 70 points, you'll get an invite in five months. I said, nah, I want to be the first one in the line. So I took the nutty test and there's a lot of architecture students in this list I can see. The other thing I can tell you is 
before people would say with 60 points in architecture, you'll get it very quickly. That's not the case anymore. So that NATI gives you five points extra, take that test. That is a very hard test. So um, like I said, bottom line is time is key. Do your homework. Nothing is easy. That's it. Thanks, Padre. <laughs> um, I think we have a question from Nicola. Um, do you want to ask your question, Nicola? Yeah, sorry, because I'm an international student and I've been in Australia for two years and a half. So I was also working before starting my master's this year. And my plan was kind of was what Pedro was talking about. So after two years of master's, I can apply for the postgraduate visa. And then I have time to do my working experience, become a registered architect, and then apply for the skilled visa. But apparently, I don't need to do the second step of the postgraduate visa, which is something I didn't know in all of the research that I've done. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to confirm with Shelley. Uh, so uh, you're just uh, checking in to see if you need to get a skills assessment done. Is that the, is that the question? Because I'm, I'm doing the master here, so we'll have an Australian degree. Do I have to be a registered architect to apply for the skilled visa? I think Veronica is saying. Uh, no, no. Is... so there's two, there's two stages to the skills assessment through AACA. There's stage one and stage two. Um, stage one is sufficient for migration purposes. So the, um, the stage one skills assessment from AACA is the skills assessment for migration purposes. Stage two is if you want to register as an architect here in Australia. So with um, stage one, I believe they just look at your um, formal qualifications. With stage two, they look at your formal qualifications as well as your work experience, so your portfolio as well. So um, stage two is only required if you want to register as an architect in Australia, but stage one is sufficient for migration purposes. So if I want to become a registered architect, I can start applying for the PR, doing only the stage one. And then once I have it, I can... Later down the track, yes, you can do stage two. Yep. Okay. Good to know that. Thank you. No worries. Okay. So, well, Shelley and TYR, is there anything that you, um, we've got six minutes left, is there anything that you, that we haven't covered that you think is, it will be interesting or valuable for our, our audience to know? I think in terms of, to Badru's point is, yeah, be organised and, you know, cross, um, um, check cross doors, whatever that saying is, but um, it can be, the visa process can be long, it can be complex, but, um, you know, it's just making sure you have all the right paperwork. And I think that's that's half the battle, really, isn't it? And Shelley would know. I mean, I'm always const in constant contact with Shelley. It's like, you're sure this is the right document? You're sure this is the right reference? And it's just that back and forth. It takes a lot of time. But, you know, stay strong because, you know, you'll get through it. And, um, you know, with a good migration agent. But even, you know, Badri, you, you hit on your shoulders there. You know, if you're at the forefront, you're proactive. It'll be a really positive outcome. So if I can only just encourage those students here that you know, do your homework, as I'm sure you've got a whole lot of other homework to do, but just keep on top of it and ask questions. Just keep asking questions. And hopefully you'll have someone that can help you and respond to you and, and help yeah, help make that process, you know, really rewarding for yourself as well. Um, and we are in really unusual times. So um, I know the visa sort of complexities happen anyway, but I mean, I know that all of this that's happening is, is adding extra stress and hopefully we'll all get through it. And, you know, we need to support each other in the industry as much as possible and help each other. So, um, and with, with good migration agent advice as well. Yeah, I think um, that's really important. I think um, keeping informed both companies and individuals is um, super, super important. Um, knowing your rights as a student as an over, uh, and overseas worker, um, knowing that, you know, work-wise you're entitled to the same rights as what an Australian or permanent resident would be is important, you know, so that you don't feel like you're any different to your, um, your Australian um, colleagues. So knowing, you know, that you've got those rights. Yes, you've got different conditions that you have to abide by uh, from a visa perspective, but um, in terms of like employment law, everyone's equal in that regard, but definitely knowledge is, um, knowledge is key uh, and keeping informed. So I think that's really, really good advice as well. Um, and yeah, keeping as connected as possible with your colleagues. And also to Badger's point, maybe 
I, we get a lot of people, we get a lot of calls saying like, so-and-so told me this or this person told me this, but it's never good to just go off what the person next to you said to you. You're, you're better off um, finding out directly from yourself, whether it's, um, you know, th through an agent um, or a migration lawyer, but then also doing your own research. I think that's a really good point because like, we do get so many calls of so-and-so told me this and as well like who 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 is this person like so it's good to to good to be armed with as much knowledge as possible that's right Shirley. just your point about contracts your australian contract is you know hopefully the hr person who's issued it will sit you know and through it with you and and look at all the clauses um i think that's really important anyway if you, even if you know whoever you are but if in particular if you want to ask questions around about certain obligations or entitlements do that from the beginning understand where where you are at and what what you're entering into because that's really important know that you are you know when you're employed you have the contract is a contract and you should be treated the same as everyone else and you might have other visa conditions but yeah sit down and go through it um it's amazing how much i've learned even going through our employment contracts and trying to understand them in more detail but yeah take the time because it it, it helps it just broadens your knowledge as well yep Definitely. I think that's the kind of goes to the last question that I have, and I know we have only got a couple of minutes, but um, there are lots of people on this call here who are not in these difficult visa situations too, who are like, might be permanent residents like I am or citizens. Um, uh, Tiwa, you've already talked a little bit about the kind of need um, for sort of empathy and just sort of being there for people, but I just wondered if you both had some brief advice to how the rest of us can help colleagues who find themselves in these tricky situations. Well, the other way around, reach out to them, you know, make <laughs> the time to, to catch up. I mean, it's, I think it's just generally, it's like, you know, checking on your neighbour really, isn't it? You know, that sort of same approach. I think in terms of if you've got something you can share about experience you've your had, or if you can just say, say how you're going. I mean, it is as simple as that, Justine, I think. Um, I, I think that also, I mean, you say you're, you're you're not a citizen, you're a permanent resident, but you know you're wanting to return and then get back into the country too. I know New Zealanders have certain certain other entitlements and rights, and makes it a little bit more easier. Um, but I think it's about checking on someone, seeing how they are, um, and staying connected. I know they're pretty kind of, you know, we use those words every day, but it is like just picking up the phone. I mean, if you're in the office, you you go around and check on people, wouldn't you? You know, and I think it's also I mean, all those practice touch points, I know we're diverging from the question a bit, but, you know, I think when you're in a practice, attend all those practice touch points, you know, be part of that sort of operational rhythm that happens, you know, keep visible, keep keen, keep interested and all of that. Um, but, yeah, hopefully that's that'll get you through. Sally, what about you? Yeah, I think um, keeping an ear to the ground for your colleagues is always good. Like, you know... Uh, it's a lot of things happen via um, word of mouth. And so any way that you can, um, you can, you know, support them in that regard, um, putting them in touch with people that they may not necessarily have been in touch with before. Um, and yeah, just um, supporting them as much as possible um, and staying connected with your colleagues because that's super important so that everyone feels a part of the same organization. And yeah, I think, um, just advocate them for them and introduce them to contacts where you can um, is really would be really good for overseas workers. Great, thank you, Naomi. Do you? Yeah, well, I guess we're we're right bang on time, so we should wrap it up there um, by thanking our wonderful guests and speakers, Shelley Duffy and Tiwa Gill, who've been really fantastic, generous, and insightful. And um, thanks, as always, to our wonderful audience with your. Uh, own insights and questions um, and thanks for coming next week it's all happening all over again is that right Justine it is it is we had something lined up but it's a little dropped out so uh, we will be uh, advising you about that soon by Tuesday as always um, we've also on Monday I think got our next midday Monday session which is for students and young grads and that you know a lot of what Parla tries to do is help build that community that we've just been talking about and build um, support networks. And that Midday Monday session is particularly for that. So um, uh, if you fall into that demographic, do come along and um, 
you know, make new friends, make new contacts, hang out with people you already know and like, you know, all that stuff across the country. Um, and uh, here at Parlour, we'll just keep trying to do things to help. So, um, so let's have a virtual round of applause for Tiwa and Shelley. <laughs> thank you. Thanks to Justine and Naomi as well. Yeah, thank you, Justine and Naomi. It was really, really great. Thank you for having, uh, thank you for having me on and the opportunity to talk. Bye, everyone. Have a lovely um, afternoon, weekend, whatever it is. Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs>